Eagles Entertainment. With the 15th pick in the NFL Draft, the Philadelphia Eagles select... You're listening to the Journey to the Draft podcast. Welcome to the Journey to the Draft podcast presented by Life Brand. I'm your host, Fran Duffy, and the final day of action at the National Scouting Combine has come to a close here in downtown Indianapolis. The defensive backs taking the field today at Lucas Oil Stadium. We are going to break it all down, and we're going to start things off with pick six, where Dane Brugler is once again going to stop by with six standouts to him from the athletic testing portion of the workout. Which corners and safeties tested the best athletically? Dane is going to hit us with that at the top of the show. After that, Draft Buzz is here, and Chris McPherson and I are going to share our thoughts from the drill work. What happened on the field? Who stood out in those position-specific drills? We're going to get to all that there in Draft Buzz before we wrap things up with Mr. Relevant, my friend, Charles Davis from NFL Network, CBS Sports. He's going to join us here at the end of the show to break down some of the needs that you need to have at corner and safety. What really plays well in the NFL, and how does that apply to a couple of the top players in this draft class? We're going to get to that there at the end of the show. As always, be sure to go on to wherever you listen to the show, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify. Leave us a rating. Leave us a review. If you're not already, be sure you're subscribed. Get the show sent to your podcast device twice weekly from now through the NFL Draft. That said, excited to start things off right now with Pick 6 and Dane Brugler. Now it's time for Pick 6. All right, we're excited to welcome back to the show Dane Brugger to go through his most impressive athletic test workouts here from the defensive back groups uh, on Sunday afternoon at Lucas, Lucas Oil Stadium. Dane, uh, let's get to your number one guy. Who, who really stood out most to you with the athletic testing? Well, how do we not start with uh, the fastest 40 at this year's combine? That's Kalen Barnes, the yep. Baylor corner. And, and this was the pick by, by me, by many out there uh, for the fastest 40-yard dash at this year's combine and he didn't disappoint four two three 40 yard dash the second fastest uh, official uh time in combine history behind john ross four two two so very very close uh barnes you know we, we've talked about him before he set the state of texas 100 meter dash record back in high school he was a two-time uh high school champ uh junior and senior year so we knew he could fly uh and when i talked to him yesterday he, he said that that his track background, he really felt gave him that just that a little bit more of an advantage uh, for the 40 yard dash. And yeah, I think it definitely showed. Yeah. I thought he had a pretty good positional workout too. the, uh, the back pedal drills where he had to go and find the football, locate and finish. I thought uh, you saw that speed, you saw that range really show up in those drills. So pretty good overall day uh, for Kalen Barnes. Who's number two for you. Tariq Woolen, UTSA. Uh, and sometimes it could be tough for guys to live up to the hype when they're earmarked as these speed demons early on. And Tariq Woolen, he was a member of Bruce Feldman's freak list. Uh, he played really fast on tape. He's got all these numbers. So speed was expected for him. So, you know, could he live up to it? And goes to the Senior Bowl, 22.45 uh, miles per hour. Sets a new Senior Bowl record uh, since they've been tracking that the last five years. Goes to the Combine, 426 uh, at 63 and a half, 205 pounds, second fastest 40 behind only Barnes uh, among the entire pool of players this year. He also jumped 42 inches uh, because, you know, why not? Uh, he's just a heck of an athlete. And uh, by, by the way, it's also interesting that Barnes, Woolen, and Tyquan Thornton, the only three players uh, at this combine, they're all run sub four threes. Uh, they're all training together pre draft. So it's, it's a ton of speed. No question. Ed, Tariq Willen uh, doing it at his weight. I actually have him right now, and I have to double check on these numbers, but as of at this point, he has the best speed score of any corner that's tested in the last 10 years that's been drafted. So, wow. uh, you know, at 200 pounds to run 4.26, uh, really, really, really impressive uh, feat there for Tariq Willen, the corner from UTSA. Again, 6'3", uh, 205 pounds. Who's number three on your list? Has to be Zion McCollum uh, from Sam Houston State. If you're a small school guy, uh, you know, FCS, uh, there, there's a little extra that you need to show at the combine, you know, whether that's fair or not. Uh, Zion McCollum, he goes out there at 6'2", 200 pounds, runs a 4'3", 3 in the 40, 11 feet in the broad, 39 and a half in the vertical. But I think maybe the most impressive, uh, the short shuttle and three cone, he was the only player this year to get under four seconds in the short shuttle, three nine four. And in a six four eight three cone that led everybody at this year's combine, uh, the fastest three cone, the fastest short shuttle, one of the fastest forties. After a strong week at the Senior Bowl, now at the combine, 
we need to be you know talking more and more about Zion McCollum and just where he falls in this draft. A five-year starter at Sam Houston State. He's a a fifth-year player, uh, 52 games started, more than any corner drafted in the last decade. Was productive, too. I mean, 58 ball disruptions. Uh, He looks like he had multiple interceptions in every season except for one, the the, the shortened season in the spring. He had one pick uh, this year on their way to a national title run. So uh, Zion McCollum, uh, solid senior bowl, I thought. Then he comes here to the Combine. Impressive work out there from the senior from Sam Houston State. Uh, Who's next guy up? Yeah, it, just to add on to that real quick, 54 passes defended over his career. Um, and he also played next to his uh, twin brother in that secondary. So uh, definitely, uh, I'm, I'm a fan of twins. So I uh, just wanted to get that in there. Um, Lewis C. Uh, from Georgia. You know, it's this has been a Georgia-themed uh, combine, on, especially on the defensive yeah, side yeah, of the ball. Yes, it has. So let, let's finish uh, with a Georgia kid, 6'2", 199. Uh, known for his ability to drive on the football, his physicality as a tackler, but he showed off the speed today, 4.37 in the 40-yard dash. That ranked top 10 among all defensive backs, faster than plenty of corners uh, that worked out today, 36 and a half in the vert. Uh, he tied for the best broad jump among all defensive players with an 11-1, uh, tied with Jeremiah Moon for the, the best uh, broad jump uh, among all defensive players. Seen has been, uh, I think, a top 50 guy for me dating back to the summer, and I think he's lived up to it in any way, in, in every way, I should say. Yeah, and I was going to say the, the positional workout I thought was pretty good as well. He uh, started really, really strong. A couple slip-ups down the stretch, but uh, Lewis Seen really looked the part. A bunch of big safeties. I'm going to talk about that uh, in the next segment with Seen, but a bunch of big safeties that just looked really, really good. They moved well. Uh, Lewis Seen, one of those guys for certain. Uh, who is number five here on this list of six? Uh, I'm going to go with Dax Hill, uh, the potential first-round pick out of Michigan. Uh, one of the few guys who did everything here, uh, and I give him credit for that. Hit 438 in the 40-yard dash, an outstanding time. His jumps were solid, 33.5-inch for 10, uh, 10-1 broad. The short shuttle, it was awesome, 406, one of the fastest at this year's combine. And then the three-cone, uh, really impressive number, 657. I mean, anything under seven is, is pretty good. So once you're talking about sub six, six in the three cone, just that's remarkable time, Uh, very twitchy player. And it definitely showed during the testing. Yeah, I thought that he had a, a really nice day overall. And you, you saw the athleticism. You saw the ball skills. I thought he finished uh, up and down the field in, in the positional work, did a really nice job. So Daxon Hill from Michigan uh, certainly belongs on this list. Who's the last guy up? Uh, let's go with Jalen Petrie. Uh, even though he did not run the 40 yard dash, uh, his, his short areas, uh, agility drills were, were really impressive. Six, seven, four in the three cone, four, one, eight, uh, short shuttle also had 35, uh, inches in the vert five eleven, just under 200 pounds. Uh, I, I know you guys are gonna be talking about him uh, with his field workout. Cause I, I caught that and it was really impressive as well. So just for a guy that's in the mix to be one of the first three safeties drafted this year, I thought Petrie uh, more than held his own as a guy that, uh, you know, he, there, there's some, uh, you know, whispers out there about him, you know, the nickname Honey Badger 2.0. And I thought, uh, you know, he, he did a nice job living up to that during his workout. Well, you guessed correctly. We are going to talk about Jalen Petrie uh, in the next segment, so I won't dive too deep into him uh, here in this one. Dane, uh, this has been awesome. You've joined us every night here uh, during our time in Indianapolis. We'll check in with you uh, this week, and we'll recap this entire experience and really kind of take away uh, the big winners from the entire week at the Combine. Thanks so much. We'll talk to you again soon here on the Journey of the Draft podcast presented by LifeBrand. Now it's time for Draft Buzz. All right, great stuff there from Dane Brugler, as always. I now welcome in Chris McPherson. C-Mac, uh, let's get into our, our final recap uh, from Indianapolis. Just like that, our trip is over. It always flies by fast, and certainly, speaking of flying, a lot of fast times down on the track with the defensive backs, nice but job. obviously uh, some very good positional workouts as well that we're about to get into. No doubt, and we'll start with the cornerback position. That was group one here that took the field uh, on Sunday afternoon at Lucas Oil Stadium. Drill started at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, interested to get your thoughts on the number one performance, the guy that really stood out most to you in this positional workout. We're going to disagree. I know who your number one is. I, at least I believe I know who your number one okay. is. Okay. I go, I thought it was very close, but I'm giving the slight edge to Auburn's oh, Roger McCreary. Nice. Okay. I like it. He was my number two by a slight so, margin. Okay. Okay. We're on the same, we're on the same wavelength. Okay. I thought his second rep in the, the drill where they have to do the back pill and they transition to the corner 45 degrees, I thought was the best among the corners. 
I noted that his legs, they look like they're, they're moving as if he's an Energizer bunny going nonstop. I think he's able to turn in a phone booth and maintain balance. Uh, the box drill, which I almost want to call it the dance drill because you're combining footwork, hip turn, agility, coordination. I thought his turns were so crisp. So I know who you're going with your number one. I think McCree a slight edge over your guy. Yeah, my, for me, it, and again, this was really, really tight too. I basically gave these guys the, the same grade uh, when you look at overall, like how they performed in the drill. Uh, I thought that Trent McDuffie from Washington yeah, just slightly edged him. And both guys were really, really good. Uh, McDuffie really, really showing up well. Uh, not to mention, I, I like the last name as well. But I think when you look at Trent McDuffie, so smooth, so fluid, so confident in everything that he was doing. Uh, you know, He made plays at all three levels. You saw him track and finish down the field. Uh, you saw the quickness in and out of cuts in the W drill. I thought that was impressive. Uh, made a nice pick. Uh, I mean, all of them were picks. I didn't think he put any balls on the ground, but uh, he made a nice play. Uh, two toe top, the two toe touch uh, drag uh, down along the sideline on the ninety degree turn. So uh, when I look at uh, the way that Trent McDuffie performed, I was just really impressed with him. But both guys, you could have gone one A, one B, uh, and I wouldn't argue with you uh, either way. Uh, after those two, who's next up on your list? I'm going to go with Darian Kendrick of Georgia. That's a good one. He was on my list, too. First backpedal to the corner drill. He just made the catch look so easy. You know, sometimes you understand why these defensive backs are playing on that side of the football. They just fight. They're not able to catch the ball naturally. But when he's in his backpedal, he looks like he's in the zone. You need to have that flatliner mentality where if a guy burns you, you have to have that composure you know, to be able to utilize that recovery speed. But I, I thought he looked like a dog ready to turn and attack while he's waiting in that back pedal. So I, I, I like Darian Kendrick's workout from a consistency basis here. I'll go with him after those top two. All right, so I'm going to go. You, you have DK Kendrick, and he was on my list as well in terms of like the guys in the, in the top five that really stood out. Okay. Uh, I'm going to ra- raise your one DK with a double dip of Kobe's here. I'm going to go with Kobe Durant from South Carolina State and Kobe Bryant from Mm. Cincinnati. I thought both guys uh, really had impressive workouts. With Kobe Durant, uh, he is a small school corner, like I said, South Carolina State, who's got a history of putting uh, players into the NFL. Uh, His ability to track and finish downfield, I thought was really impressive. I thought that he really uh, showed up well across the board, and and the quickness was there, the burst, the close to finish uh, was really, really impressive. And then with Kobe Bryant, uh, this is a guy who won the Thorpe Award as the number one defensive back in college football. Consistent finishing ability. I really liked the way uh, that he was able to finish at the catch point. The athleticism was just okay. I thought he stumbled uh, in and out of a couple breaks, but uh, I thought he executed all the drills really, really well, maximized every single ounce of movement uh, that he's got in his body. I, I, I think when you look at uh, Kobe Durant, Kobe Bryant, both those guys belong in this discussion as well. Uh, is there another guy or two uh, to round, on, round this one out? Uh, I'm going to go a little under the radar. I think there's a, a top liner that we need to discuss, but I'm going to go with someone a little under the radar who I liked, Josh Thompson out of Texas. Nice. Okay, I thought he was the most natural going through the gauntlet. The Terrell Austin drills, which you know brings some more lateral movement and quick reaction to the ball. I thought he did well making sharp turns, offering a quick reaction when having to make the catch there. So Josh Thompson, I thought just you know as you're going down and you know just checking the boxes all throughout the workout. Who was the uh, the big the big name uh, that you were bringing up? We got to talk. I feel like I at least mentioned Sauce Gardner. Sure. Okay. You the discussion. Yeah, you know, and I think he thought thought in the box drill again. You gotta. Yeah, dance a little bit there. The, his legs, I I compare it to a spider weaving a web, okay? Mm-hmm. You know, just envision a little spider trying to make the web, and you see those legs just going in and out, in and out, in and out. Uh, I thought he had a little twitch, and I thought he did well overall, especially coming in with, I know Dane talked about that pressure that these top-line guys have. I thought uh, Sauce Gardner had a solid workout overall. A body type that's similar that I thought oh, looked good too, a Caleb Evans uh, from Missouri. I thought he had a good solid one. workout uh, as well. Uh, real quickly, I forgot to mention at the top, the players that did not pra- or did not participate in the positional portion of this workout, uh, only a handful from the corner, so it was a long workout. Andrew Booth from Clemson, disappointed not to be able to see him uh, work out up close. Tariq Castro-Fields from Penn State, he did some of the athletic testing, did not do the positional work. No Josh Job from Alabama, so the, the, the senior 
senior there. He did not participate. Marcus Jones from Houston, uh, he missed the senior bowl and then also uh, obviously missed the combine uh, with shoulder injuries. He had actually had to get surgery on both shoulders. Uh, won't be ready until the season, according to our buddy uh, Dane Brugler. And then Derek Stingley Jr., uh, potential top 10 pick, top 5 pick potentially uh, out of LSU. He did not participate either uh, due to Liz Frank surgery back in the fall. He will be a go for his pro day. So uh, that'll shut the door there on the corners. Let's now transition to group two, the safety group. And before we get into it, a handful of those guys that did not participate, C-Mac. Uh, Bubba Bolden from Miami, he couldn't go. Jaquan Brisker from Penn State, a lot of people really excited about what he could have done with the athletic, te- athletic testing portion. Uh, but I think when you look at the position work, he couldn't go. Quinterio Cole, uh, the transfer from Alcorn State that went to Louisville uh, for his final season, he could not go for the positional work. Brian Cook from Cincinnati, Yusef Corker from uh, Kentucky, and then Colby Harvell Peel from Oklahoma State. So a bunch of safeties couldn't go. That made that work out pretty short. But that said, it was pretty clear and well-defined who the, 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 cream, the cream rose to the top, I felt, with this safety group, C-Mac. And uh, I think you and I agreed on who the, the most impressive individual position-only workout was uh, here this afternoon. Did he go to Toledo? He went to Toledo. Was That's his name right. Tyson Anderson? Tyson is it Anderson. Tyson? I hope his name is still That's Tyson it. Anderson. So uh, I, I think, first of all, I mentioned this on the previous podcast, when you have to go first, you got to get a little slight edge, a little some bonus points or something, because they'll usually have another player who's further down the line kind of display how you run the drill, but to be the first person each time to have to go first. But he did a great job modeling the drills. And look, his back pedal to quarter, I thought, I just said, wow, when you see the range and the ball skills was so in control, smooth in the W drill where you're going in and out of cuts, an easy mover in that box drill. In fact, you know, sitting next to Fran inside Lucas Oil Stadium, he was so excited after Tyson Anderson did the box drill. I can't even repeat what he said. He was just that emphatic. <laughs> All right. He was he was juiced up. He was fired up. So but now okay, I think it was fairly close. I thought Anderson was the was a clear winner, but it was pretty close going into the it gauntlet. Was. So if you want to say, okay, maybe could someone have come up here? Tyson Anderson aced it to seal the drill. Just put the hammer into the nail to finish off. Such an impressive, impressive day. And you have to keep in mind, just for how big he is, I mean, he's six foot one and a quarter, just over 200 pounds. He's got 33 inch long arms, C Mac. He's got a ridiculous wingspan for a safety that big to be as fluid as he was. The line drills, the back pedal drills, where he's got to make plays down the field. He had an outstanding finish uh, where he's able to track it over the top and make a play. He had a great spinning interception along the sideline on the first Terrell Austin drill. Uh, so I think when you look at Tyson Anderson, uh, he was really impressive. But I mean, we talked about him in the last segment with Dane. Jalen Petrie was really, really, really good uh, as well. He was so smooth, so natural. Everything was really, really easy. Uh, it was neck and neck for me with, with these two. Up until the end, there was one slip up there um, from Petrie on one of the final drills, but uh, we're kind of splitting hairs. I thought Petrie was excellent as well. Yeah, I was going to say top of the class in the back pedal drill. You know, he just showed the acceleration through the turns, you know, and that back pedal to the flat drill. So, again, you know, kind of a one, one A, one B. I actually have someone who I might put slightly above Ooh. Petrie. Okay, who do you got? Who, who do you like? Is it uh, Kyle Hamilton? No. Who is it? Nick Cross from Maryland. Yeah, he had a good workout. He's on, okay. the, he's on my list as well. All right, display quick change of direction skills in the Terrell Austin drills. Check the box from a back pedal standpoint. You know, from a hip turn standpoint. Ran through the ball well with acceleration. Made the gauntlet look easy. So emphasizing those ball skills to steady across the board. I think he was that guy that, you know, maybe it was a little under the radar, kind of like the shark under the water. And then all of a sudden, you know, some of the guys, they have a little hiccup here and there. Nick Cross, steady Eddie all the, all the way through to the end. So, But those three would definitely be my top three when you're looking at Anderson, Cross, and Petrie. I, I think you throw Kyle Hamilton in there as well. Um, and, and Kyle Hamilton was rock solid across the board, especially I think early on he looked a little clunky. It's kind of like what we were talking about with Sauce Gardner and a Caleb Evans. Like when you have some of these leggy frames, sometimes you can look a, a little gawky in transition. And I thought you saw a little bit of that with Kyle Hamilton. Um, but overall, just a really good workout. No balls on the ground. Uh, you saw his ability to finish downfield. He made some nice plays uh, late in the workout. I thought he finished really, really strong. So uh, Kyle Hamilton projected top 10, top 15 type pick. Uh, you know, he followed through uh, for certain uh, with his workout. No question. Who's uh, a little We'll go one more guy each. Who's one more guy uh, that you want to throw Let in Let me here? do Dax Hill, Michigan. Sure. A plus in the gauntlet. 
Back pedal can do it. Check. Hip turn, check. Lateral agility, just check, check, check across the board. Uh, just very solid. You do a little, little dance there. I thought that's what Kyle uh, Hamilton looked like doing the uh, box drill toward the end. It looked like he was doing a little cha-cha mm. action. But Dax Hill from Michigan, I think, was another steady player throughout his positional workout. So I include him here in, in this group of the top performers. Uh, I'm going to throw in Oregon's Verone McKinley. Uh, really rangy. No balls on the ground. He had a couple slip-ups here, but uh, I think when you look at his overall workout, really, really impressive. He bought good energy uh, throughout as well. I thought he was one of the more energetic guys out there. Uh, really, really smooth. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is a guy that was a finalist for the Thorpe Award for some of the big plays he created in that Oregon Duck secondary. Uh, I thought he followed through with a really good positional workout. And uh, C-Mac, I think the safety group overall, also one of the, the chattier groups, and one of the more fun groups to watch uh, kind of go through the workout. Maybe not quite to the level of like the linebackers yesterday, uh, but that safety group, I right? And they and they also ended really really strong as well. That, I was waiting for. I'm like, I no hope far. we get in. Yes. Don't forget. Don't, don't forget, forget. Don't forget. So J T Woods from Baylor, last player going through the gauntlet, aces it. He's turned up the field, and all the teammates, you know, knowing that this is the end of the combine, they're running with him into the end zone. It's like watching the Eagles and Darius Slay take one to the house, and all of his teammates are falling behind. They're getting ready to do the Bud Light Sally. You know, that's what it felt like here watching JT Woods take it to the house and everyone was juiced up. The fans that were in attendance at Lucas Oil Stadium were loving it. So great energetic finish to a very, very good day. Again, these last two days, especially with the front seven yesterday, and I know, Fran, you said that it was one of arguably the best, you know, groups of workouts that you've seen. Yesterday, it was outstanding. And yep. then going to today, two more very good groups in action. So a wonderful weekend of football, you know, outside the pro days, man, this is it. We're getting That's to it. crunch time of the draft and, you know, so much fun to see these guys compete all weekend, all week long, really, here in Indianapolis. Well, I hope everybody out there listening has enjoyed uh, our coverage here from the Indianapolis Scouting Combine. This episode is not over, though, because we catch up with our good friend, Charles Davis from NFL Network. Hope you listen to him uh, all weekend long as well during the live coverage of this event. Let's get to that interview now for Mr. Relevant. It's time for Mr. Relevant. Well, really excited to welcome back here to the Journey of the Draft podcast, my friend Charles Davis from NFL Network. You can check him out uh, this week here covering the NFL Scouting Combine, obviously on CBS Sports. Charles, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, Fran, thanks for having me. It's always great to be on with you, always great to do this, and hopefully I'm up to the challenge. No, absolutely. We know that uh, you are definitely uh, <laughs> bigger than this. Uh, let's get into uh, cornerback. Yeah. Uh, I'd love to talk about secondary with you. Um, what do you need to play a corner uh, in today's game? What are the most important qualities in your mind? You know, it's funny, your former coach, Doug Peterson, he used to use that expression, fearless. Mm. And you remember during the Super Bowl year, he yep. was extremely fearless. Yeah. When, and it wasn't just going forward on fourth down. It wasn't just, you know, making those tough decisions. It was how you went about your day. You know, guys, there's nothing to fear. It doesn't yep. matter who's out there playing. If they're wearing the Eagles jersey, we're going to be fine. We're going to mm. figure it out. That's a big word for me with corners. That's a big word for me for defensive backs. We always get caught on the, oh, well, you have a short memory. That makes sense. Yep. But I also think that it helps if you remember what happened before. Mm. But you can put it aside and make your improvements. Yep. Because if you just put it aside totally, you might make the same mistakes over and over again. I want you to analyze it a little bit, but not dwell on it. So if you have those things, forget the physical gifts. Yep. That's the part you've got to have to me to sustain the sustained success in this league. Well, that's what I feel like. Just pa passing games are too good now, where you you're going to get beat. Like Jalen Ramsey, he's, he's not throwing many shutouts. Yeah, well, why, widely regarded as probably the top corner in football. We saw him give up big plays down the stretch in the playoffs and the Super Bowl. Uh, you're, if you're you're going to get beat. If you're throwing out, you're going to get beat. So uh, having that ability, uh, whether you know how you fight through that adversity, is just so so important. Um, you know, and that fearlessness. To me, like, you know, people will say, like, oh, you know, you pay corners to cover, not to, to, to tackle. Tackling just so, so important now in today's game. Absolutely, because we also saw during the playoffs, we saw during the season, your Eagles are a prime example. People can run the football again. Yeah. And I think a lot of that is reaction to how defenses are slimming down. Yep. We've talked about this, you and I, before. Over the last 10 years, I think the measurements of defenses – Defenders coming to the combine have gotten slimmer and slimmer, smaller and yep. smaller. Not to where they can't hit, but you sure. know what I'm saying. Yeah. It's not the same monster guys coming in at every position. So what's the answer for offenses? Well, let's beef up a little bit. Yep. Okay, who are the leading rushers in the league this year? They're all 220-pound guys, yeah. right? So they're going to inflict some damage 
by the fourth quarter, I thought, if anything, Cincinnati didn't run Judd Nixon enough in the Super Bowl because yeah. he had a few of those runs. And he got to that third level and made some people pay. Yep. And I think that's what we're looking for during that time. So, yes, tackling's huge for these corners. And you mentioned Jalen Ramsey. He's never had a problem coming up and throwing his body around. No. Yeah, you know, the, who was the, the guy before that? Patrick Peterson. Who yes. will come down and smack you, Terrific too. Cat, um, terrific tackle. And, I, and to, for me, it's like the run game, but also screens, RPOs, jet sweeps, like all those perimeter plays. Like you, you need your corners on an island to be able to win one on one, and at least be able to cause rubble. Right. Sure. Because when you're throwing those RPOs, when you're throwing those screens and all that, who's coming out to get you? Usually the tackle, mm -hmm. right? Maybe they pull somebody big's coming out to take you out. So nowadays, because we can't go low and cut them and cause rubble, right. that means you got to get down there, hold your ground, take the hit, and try and hold the edge a little bit so that other people can get there. So you're exactly right. So let's talk about some of these corners uh, in this class. We'll start with a guy that uh, made his name well known very early in his career, and that's Derek Stingley Jr. from LSU. Uh, haven't seen too much of him in the last right. couple of years, but uh, it's to kind of get your take on the talented LSU Jr. I think if he didn't have the freshman year that he had that was so overwhelmingly great, yeah. we would be saying the boomer bust would be coming in. Because yep. I don't think anybody expects him to bust. Yep. But will he boom the way we saw his freshman year, mm. sophomore, junior year? is not quite the same. Some injury issues. COVID, of course, kicked in. But he wasn't the same consistent force we saw that year. Yeah. That first year, I don't know how you saw it, but I was like, oh, my goodness. I mean, he's All-American as a freshman. Not freshman All-American. All-American and well-deserved. And it was a legit deal. It wasn't yeah. just because he came in touted. He went up against the best in the country. I mean, yeah. he's going against his Bama receivers, all those guys, and more than held his own. In fact, he was the one that they feared. So that's what we're trying to figure out. Are we getting that young man? Or is he more like what we've seen the last two years? Yep. If he's more like we've seen the last two years, he might not go where we originally projected. Yep. That freshman year, we were saying top five. Yep. I mean, there's, now there, there's practice tape going around uh, of him and, uh, and Jamar Chase from 2019. That's like maybe that opens people's eyes. And but it's, it's a, he's an impressive player. But there's no really doubt is. the last two years coming to play. I still believe he's going to be a first round pick. I yeah. think people are going to buy into who he is and the athleticism. You know, what do we saw before? But he may not go as high as we thought. That'll be an interesting deal when people come up. I think depending on what happens in front, that'll determine sure. just how high he goes. Because maybe some people take some guys that, okay, now we're out of the edge rushers. Sure. Now we're at it. I'm going to go get him. So another guy that's being talked about as a potential first corner off the board is uh, Sauce Gardner, oh, Ahmad yeah. Gardner from Cincinnati. Uh, interesting kind of get your thoughts on him. Well, I think that he's a lot like we were talking about. He is fearless. He will tackle. Mm -hmm. He will do all the things you're looking for. The interesting part is that his stats don't measure up to his partner's stats on the other side, yep. but he's the better player. Yep. You know, so so that's where a kick breaks down because you're saying, well, who won the awards? Who won this? Who won that? When it comes to the NFL, I don't think there's ever been a scouting room that said, well, you know, he was all for he was all conference first team or he was all American, and that's why we like him ahead of the other guy. Right. I, you've been around a long time. That's never uttered. No. Sauce Gardner length. Ability to throw his body around, makes plays on the football, and a lot of people avoided him too. Mm. Okay, let's go to the safety spot. In your mind, I'll start the same way I started corner. What do you need to be able to succeed playing safety in the NFL today? Nowadays, you can't be one dimensional, right? I don't think. Yeah. I don't think that you can just be a box safety or a free safety, yeah. like a ranging center field. Some programs you can do that. Yeah. You know, few and far between now. Gus Bradley yeah. does not mind still having that. He's still trying to recreate yeah. the Batman and Robin he had with Seattle with Cam Chancellor as a strong safety. Earl Thomas is the ultimate cleanup guy, the ultimate right. eraser. But it's hard to find. You know, they tried to do that with Jonathan Abram and Trayvon Merring last yeah. year. It's hard. You gotta be able to cover, you gotta be able to range, and you gotta be able to drop down there and play. I per personally believe most teams want what I call mirrors mm. as safety. You got your two safeties. If, we, if the strength switches sides, one drops down, one's back. They switch the other side, one drops down, one's back. Yep. In my day, Fran, the strong safety ran across formation. Right. The free safety ran across formation to get to the opposite spot. I don't think that's what we're looking for these days. Yeah, that interchangeable skill set uh, is so, so important. We're seeing all these uh, the, the split safety coverages. and uh, you, you don't need one guy deep and one guy uh, short. It's it's really interesting to see more and more. And honestly, teams getting away from man coverage. We can get back to that with uh, the corner spot. You're seeing less man coverage, uh, purely just pure man schemes, I should say. Obviously, everybody's still playing man. Um, but it's a, it's a really interesting kind of discussion when it comes it, to the safety It spot. is. We're getting those a lot of quarters coverage. Yep. So if you're getting quarters coverage, both safeties got to be able to yeah. – to do stuff, match. You, you you know we get that cover six with the quarter quarter half. Yep. All right, which guy's gonna be in the hash? Which guy's gonna be in coverage? 
it, you know, it's hard to protect them. Yep. It's hard to make those substitutions, this, that, and everything. You still have enough guys. Yep. So you want guys who can go ahead and do it. And in the past, a the corner safety combo player, that was the, that was the tweener. Yes. Uh, that's, a, that's a negative, that's a dirty word. Now those guys are kind of seen as valuable because of the, the prevalence of big nickel and uh, teams getting into some of those bigger subs. If you can find four corners now, a lot right. of teams will play with four corners, yeah. ostensibly, right? right? Because most of the time they feel like most teams will not stick with the run long enough to hurt them. I think we're trending a little bit more the other way now, Brand, from what I'm seeing. Again, your Eagles were an example. Cincinnati, I had them a couple of times. They got away from them in the Super Bowl, but I watched them run Las Vegas into oblivion down the stretch by sticking with the run and beating people up. You know Tennessee's going to do that because they got Derrick Henry. So we're seeing a little bit more of that. But, yeah, you know, as this goes on, as we see it, those tweener guys that we're talking about are more the corner safety, not the, you know. Yeah. And they've got the ability to run. And, and you know, that young man out of Notre Dame. I was just want to ask you, Kyle Hamilton, where does he fit into this discussion? Top of the list. Yeah. I mean, I know he didn't get to play the full year last year. He had some injury issues. But, my goodness. And let's face it. Are we going to see the interception that he made against Florida My, State until Florida State this week thing's one. over? That's it. Like, that was one of the best ranging plays. Yep. The, the best play I saw to equal it this year that I saw, not saying there weren't others, was uh, in the playoffs. I can't remember if it was Jordan Poyer or Micah Hyde against New England yep. in the game we had. And he made that type of a play. Mm. That's that's what we saw. And I thought Hamilton's was more impressed because I think he came from farther. Yeah. I mean, that's a lot of range. Plus – it's six four, packing two twenty, and he does he does strike you. Yes. He will tackle you. Yeah, with his chest up. But he's oh not, yeah, he's, he's, a, not, he's, he's not, not going cut, He's not cutting you. He's not dragging. Yep. He's he's coming through you. Yeah, I really like him a lot. And look, he could be a top five pick. Yeah, I mean, you, when you're talking just pure talents in the yes. draft, he's in that discussion. And uh, that's going to be the interesting part. Where we talk about our boards. Yep. You let the board talk to you, and yep. if it does, he can very well come off by five. It's it's fascinating too because we had Kyle Pitts last year, and it was always a tight end worth taking in the top five. Now you get this player who is this freak show, six four two ten, that you would say like, yeah, he fits against a guy like Kyle Pitts. Uh, I don't know that I love Kyle Pitts in man to man all the time, right. but you know that kind of uh, dichotomy, I think, is really interesting. It really is, and you know what I think about like Denver with Justin Simmons. Yeah, right. Like sure. how many like when you chart a guy like Justin Simmons, how many different places are you popping him in your chart? He's yep. all over the place. Yep. To me, that's Kyle Hamilton. Yeah, checking a lot, a lot of boxes. Uh, Charles, thanks so much. We're going to let you uh, get going here. Obviously, uh, outstanding coverage all week long here in Indianapolis. Thanks so much for joining us here on the Journey of the Draft podcast. Thanks for having me as yeah. always. You're the best. Great stuff there from Charles Davis. Always great to be able to catch up with him. That'll do it for our week of coverage here at the National Scouting Combine in Indianapolis. I fly out tomorrow morning, heading back home to Philadelphia. We'll be back later this week, the early stages of the week. Myself, Dane Brugler, Ben Fennel. We're going to break down everything we took in over the last week. A lot of information to kind of cull through, but we're going to get through it. We're going to break it all down for you right here on the Journey to the Draft podcast presented by LifeBrand.